built for the tribe. What did your dad do? Is he still um, living? Yeah, this is July 25th, 1984. Mm -hmm. And what's your full name, sir? Ted. Ted Reynolds. Ted Reynolds. Built this first room. It had an opening the 12th of January, 1964. Mm-hmm. Now, who, who sponsored the library? Well, when I, had the, when I dug the footing, for this library, I didn't have one penny. Hmm. And uh, now it's the Walter Hart, L. Hart Library. Walter L. Hart. Now who was Walter Hart? Walter L. Hart was a very precious friend. Lived at Paul's Valley. And uh, so uh, we built this room recently. And uh, here was the first room. The reason we logged this up, this was broken into ten times when I quit counting and had to log it up. The lake attracted an element of people. Yeah. And uh, they break in sometime just to have party. And this was our picture the first year we were here, mm -hmm. 1952. Wife's Caddo, and she had land out in Caddo County. Government took the surface to build that dam out of Fort Cobb. Well, she gave two acres to the American Legion, which was a tragic mistake. This fellow, Charlie Phillips, was the commander and organizer of the post, knowing him all my life. But as soon as they got the building where the racketeers put Charlie out. Hmm. And uh, this is one of our many weddings. Mm -hmm. We've given a uh, More than 10,000 books away. What are you collecting these days in the way of... Well, I, I tell you, uh, here's something you might... Oh. This is my report card. Seventh grade report card. Sadie Hyde. You remember Herbert K. Hyde? I've heard the name. Herbert K. Hyde was the best United States District Attorney in the Western District. Mm -hmm. This was his sister. Hmm. And see the year? 1918, 1919. Then here's my... Uh, This is my first grade. Alice Eskew was your teacher? Mm-hmm. The stars then, you attend Sunday school regularly for a month and put a gold star. I'm against prayer in the public schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you read about the mess they had with the Little Axe School some time ago? I uh, remember some. What was the cause of all that? Some of the shallow denominationalists wanted to brand all the kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the trade name brand religion. And uh, I would judge, since my family had been in the teaching profession for 200 years, that uh, today, 62, you can put a little thing there. I was going to get this photograph. Oh, that's a picture of my mother and her sister. Hmm. Mm -hmm. 
She was born 14th May, 1874. And, uh, and uh, what was the upshot of that thing at Little Axe? Well, uh, since they built this lake, more than 50 of our families had to move. Many people moved into the community that didn't know one thing about the background music. And uh, uh, one group of uh, Holy Rollers and uh, Blabdis, they wanted to uh, convert all the children, brand them with their brand of religion. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, more or less a mockery. I was on the school board that was given to me in 1943. Yeah. And uh, this is the last Shawnee man to walk five paces ahead. Tom White. Uh, Indians, a custom among most Indians, uh, 75 years ago, even up 50 years ago, they walked five paces ahead of their woman. And Tom White was the last Shawnee man to have the courage to walk five paces ahead of his what was? Why did they do that? What was? Well, the man was the head of the household, and he was treated with respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, uh, today why the Indians, like many other people, so they don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. They. But all these are uh, scrapbooks. This is this is our first church roll, and uh, this one. Mm -hmm. I was ordained in the Indian Mission of the Methodist Church. We severed our relation with the church in 1958. This is 1953? Yeah, 52, starting 52. 52. Hmm. There wasn't a church here when we started. This is our church record since uh, we moved up here. Now I have a but starting without any, I arranged through the Indian office to uh, get the community house, frame building built for the Shawnees. Mm -hmm. So we came down from the city, and uh, the first Sunday, they had a stomp dance the night before. We expected a few, but didn't anyone show up. We brought our lunch and went outside to eat our lunch, and hound dog and two pups showed up. So I told my wife that that was a good Indian almond. Indian takes his dog to heaven, white man sends his brother to hell. And that was the beginning. The next uh, Sunday, while well, we had uh, about 40, and, but it's one of the most difficult areas in the world because of the practice of witchcraft and the use of peyote. And uh, that's my trophy case. Each one of those objects had something to do with the ministry. Mm -hmm. That was given to me in 1974. Master Early Gardener. We won that in $100 in 1959 Rural Neighborhood Improvement. Yeah. program sponsored the Farmer Stock and Extension hmm. Division. 
one first place. This is now all these scrapbooks are just the history of the church. Mm -hmm. That's my that isn't a part of the church. Okay. That was my first scrapbook. Uh -huh. And uh, but this my the uh, this is from the special collection section University of Tennessee Library at Knoxville. And I gave the library there in honor of my mother, who was born about forty miles from Knoxville. Mm -hmm. This was mostly about witchcraft and peyote. The, uh, do you know anything about peyote? Just a very little. Yeah. Well, here's a... Let me show you here. Look. This little girl was one of the most wonderful little girls. Mm -hmm. she How many members of the church have now? Well, we don't go by numbers. Uh, through the years, we have uh, had uh, 240 who uh, accepted Christ in the profession of faith. We've had, uh, of course, during the years, uh, many to die, and some to move away. Here's wagon yard politics. What is wagon yard politics? <laughs> You're too young to remember when they had wagon yards. Well, I know what they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my dad, Sam Reynolds, we can go outside, and uh, his brother-in-law, Matt Burnett. Matt Burnett was a cousin of Burke Burnett. Mm -hmm. They made the run together. My dad, like five months, being 21. This is 22nd, 1889. The family, like thousands and thousands of other families, suffered from the war between the states, my family on both sides. And there was an exodus of people uh, from the north to south. And my dad had worked on a ranch from the time he was, uh, is that on? He had worked on a ranch from the time he was 13 years old till he's 19. And he went from uh, Montague County, Texas, alone, up through the Panhandle, the Colorado, the Dakotas, and Wyoming. He was gone for about a year, and he came back down to Fort Sill, and he got a job issuing, helping issue uh, commodities to the Western Indians, Comanches. Where was this? Fort Sill. Fort Sill. And uh, so he went back down to Texas, and when this, when this, not this area, but Norman, opened for settlement, why, he and Matt Burnett, his brother-in-law, made the run. My dad had learned from the time he was 13 to 19, uh, working on a ranch, he learned how to play poker and play a fiddle, ride and shoot. Norman was a tent city overnight. Anywhere from 12 to 1400 people, because a lot of people out on outlying areas. And his first job was a dealer in a tent, gambling place. And two years later, when he married my mother, 1891, he uh, 
started working, he'd work some as a common labor. The scale then is two dollars now, two dollars a day. And uh, started learning the painting trade. Well, I had three older brothers, and we grew up, grew up in the trade. And uh, our first transport transportation was a buckskin pony, a Mustang named Dick. And uh, we had a flatbed hack that we hauled paint and step ladders around Norman, about 1,500 population. But within a period of 40 years, our business expanded over five states public buildings and fine homes. And uh, I gave up a good business in Oklahoma City to come out here to Little Axe to found the Indian mission for the Shawnees. The Shawnees had been in this area since 1886. They were living among the Potawatomies over in Potawatomie County. Potawatomie County then extended two miles west of this road here. And they had a little over 70,000 acres of land. And there were 567 on the Shawnee Road, absentee Shawnee. And over a period of years, in 1891, the Dawes Commission permitted the white element to come in and buy the land. And uh, the re result of it was, uh, unfortunately for the Indian, uh, many of the people were good, hard-working people and uh, wanted to establish a home. But then the gambling and the bootlegging element uh, preyed on the Indian, skinned them in uh, card games. And uh, so I was familiar with this community all my life. My dad was a friend of Little Jim, the last chief. They were about the same age beginning in 1891. Was that Jim, Little Axe? Little Jim, Little Jim. Little Jim. Yeah. Big Jim, his dad, uh, had been wanting to move this Shawnee band of Indians to Mexico. The reason he wanted to move the Kickapoos uh, been down to Mexico for a number of years. They liked the country, and they could come back up into this country, and in the last 50 years, while there's a migration of them going to St. Louis, and Kansas City, Chicago, Detroit, and work about six months out of the year, then they go back down to Mexico and live like kings. Well, Big Jim and a few Shawnees went down in 1900. And uh, he took uh, chicken pox and died. So uh, uh, Billy Littleax and Joe Billy were the co-chiefs from 1900 to 1907 when uh, Little Jim got old enough, according to tribal custom, to become a chief. And he was chief until the first of January 1961, when he died. And uh, since then, uh, Little Jim was a wonderful man. Ella, his wife, great people. What was he like, Little Jim? Little Jim uh, didn't talk too much, and especially with strangers. But uh, he would think the older Indians used to behold the wonders of all of nature, everything that crawled, everything that leaped, everything, uh, the fowls of the air and the fish. And in beholding, they studied and learned uh, the story of nature that you couldn't learn in school or from a book. So. Uh, 
we would visit more than 50 years ago. I lived down on the river more than 50 years ago. Little Jim would come down and visit with me. We'd be on the bank of the river watching the flow of water and probably two hours we wouldn't speak more than 50 words. Our mind was in the same channel. Uh, we respected one another. I respected little Jim's belief and he respected mine. And to prove this, after we started the work of the Lord, uh, we grew closer and closer together. When little Jim was blind physically the last 15 years of his life, Ella was in his wheelchair, his wife. And when little Jim would get in the mail from the Indian office, his family would tell him about it. After they all told him, then he'd tell one of them, you go get Ted. Well, when I told him, that's the way it is. Settle it. And uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful relation. I respect uh, the common knowledge and understanding of the older people, the young, they don't have any of those uh, talents or blessing and they don't have any desire to know and learn the truth about uh, in it. And so, <clears throat> in 1954, two years after we started, Due to the death of a woman up in her 80s, she had been witched, and uh, the uh, parody element used the practice of witchcraft. This woman had not been fed in five weeks bed had not been changed in five weeks. So I went to see her, and see about her. She was out under Brush Arbor, hot August day. And asked what they wanted. And of course they named over the food, out of food. I said, well, how about doctor? Well, her son-in-law said, well, Ted, I guess we should get doctor. I said, do you th would you listen to a doctor? He said he would. So I got food, got a doctor to come out, and prescribed two medicines, and got the medicine. Then, the next morning, well, I took ice. The head purity man and the, uh, one of his boys were dragging up wood. They were getting ready to have a purity meeting. Well, when you have a purity meeting all night, have feast the next day noon. The reason they hadn't had a meeting before, they didn't have the food for the feast. So I furnished the food. She died the following Tuesday. And that following Sunday, I told the people that they were going to make a choice between the teaching of Christ and the use of peyote. You're not going to use me to put clothing on your back and shoes on your feet and food in your belly then go back to peyote. If it's going to be peyote, stay with it. He said, you cannot mix the teaching of Christ and peyote any more than you can mix the darkness of a starless midnight with a noonday sun. Well, that's what started the battle over peyote and witchcraft. And uh, the, uh, they ruined their well, the peyote people ruined their well, and rocked her house, put threatening note up on the community house door. And since my wife uh, was Caddo, and the Caddo's had about the same background as Shawnee's, one of her granddads, a period of man, been dead for years, but some of the Caddo people come over, came over and told her, said, 
Why did you end in sick? You've been witched. And the only way you can throw this spell off is forced to have to quit the ministry. And I had that struggle for many years. And the head peyote man was a dangerous man. And uh, about 10 years after this started, well, I picked him up on the road, he's catching a ride from Norman. And I told him that you should know that I don't scare and uh, I'm going to forgive you for everything you tried to do against me. And when we get to the little acts, if you mean it, we shake hands and be friends. But if you don't mean it, we stay just like we've been. Well, uh, wasn't long after that, uh, he tried to commit suicide and shot his eye out. Then, in wintertime, had a big dishpan on a wood-burning fire, cook stove. He had a spell and fell over that stove, and severe burn. And he's in the crippled children's hospital burn unit. I went up to see him. I walked in the room, and it's about 11.30 in the morning, and he asleep one eye. So the nurse came in, she said that, you can wake him up, I'm gonna have to feed him. So I walked around on the other side, put my hand on his forehead, and I said, Mosa te wasimo. He opened up, my good friend. He died, uh, took four years, and uh, the most miserable, horrible, paralyzed. His normal weight was around 165, and when he died, possibly not even 80. And, uh, but all of these things, uh, I knew them before I came out. I attended my first peyote meeting two mile and a half north more than 50 years ago. Peyote is an interesting drug. Uh, the best uh, article on peyote was prepared by Dr. Robert E. L. Newburn. Robert E. L. Newburn. He was the chief medical supervisor for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And he gathered most of this material from the files, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And the story, beginning down Mexico, among the Aztec, <coughs> purity in its native habitat runs from the mouth of the Pecos River southeastward down into Old Mexico. And uh, after the Spanish invasion, Cortez, uh, the horses scared the Indian, and uh, they used and started using peyote to excess. It's like any other drink or stimulant, drug. Uh, if you use it to excess, it becomes harmful. And it contributed in destroying the uh, Aztec civilization. Wherever it is used, it's a mighty dividing force because those who do not use it, they don't know anything about it, but they're scared to death of those who do use it. And uh, the Navajos passed a law many years ago against the use of the traffic in Peyote. But uh, Philio Nash was an anthropologist, and uh, during the Kennedy administration, he was appointed uh, to head the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And during his five years, the spread of peyote and the use of it from Mexico to the Crees in Canada. Uh, ten times over before he went in. Uh, to understand 
any stimulant, uh, the uh, British flooded China with opium. They controlled India, and in order to gain control of China, they produced all the opium they could possibly produce from the poppies, and it brought on the first opium war. They had two wars, the British and China, over the spread of opium. And uh, you couldn't convince uh, anyone in China that opium is a religion. But to hoodwink and keep in the dark, it's like uh, the practice of peyote. The first hypo is to quarantine the victim from truth. So uh, John Collier was a commissioner of Indian Affairs years ago, and Governor Thomas, the United States Senator, Lawton, some of the Comanches and uh, Ponkas and uh, Kiowas and uh, Sack and Fox, they convinced Elmer Thomas that peyote was like a sacrament and uh, part of their culture. To the native American church. Nothing mentioned about peyote. And uh, here recently, well, while Carter was uh, president, the Senate passed a resolution uh, saying that uh, the Indians should be privileged to use their sacrament, peyote. There isn't, isn't any more sacrament than a quart of liquor. But it's very deceptive, very destructful, very harmful. The ones who use it to excess right here in this area. They, some of them die of heart attack. Some of them go bad as they can possibly get. Uh, I experienced and been in orbit fueled by peyote. And here's the, the effect. It's such a terrific stimulus on your senses. For a while, you can see the most minute object. You'd have to have magnifying glass. And your sense of hearing. On a quiet day, a dry leaf, you hear the leaf fall. Your sense of uh, time, you lose all uh, sense of time. I uh, used peyote till midnight over the meeting. If people asked me to come over and pray for a little boy they were having a meeting for, start the meeting, stayed till midnight. We were living in one room in the community house. So I left the light on and clocked by the bed, and here's a, a brief description. Uh, beyond the moon, the normal mind could not imagine or conceive the beauty of all the colors. And uh, I woke up and looked at the clock, and that extended over a period of five minutes. Went back to sleep, and the next scene was a raging uh, inferno. Fire, two or three hundred feet, flames, feel the heat, and uh, that was about five, six minutes. In each one of these scenes, the, uh, the normal mind could not imagine or conceive. And it lasted, it extended from midnight to six in the morning. I don't know how many times I've been drunk. Not that I'm proud of it. And I've had some terrible hangovers. One hangover from peyote is equal to 10 of liquor. It takes a mind uh, at least a week to get back to normal after excessive use of peyote. 
So I'd rather if you would uh, ask any question you want to ask. First of all, when's your birthday? Where were you born? 8th of February, 1906. 631 East Eufaula, Norman. And you were born in Norman? Mm-hmm. Okay. All my family. Okay. And you say your father made the run of 89? April 22nd, 1880. But he wasn't quite 21 years old. Five, like five months. Did he stake a claim then? He staked a claim northeast of Norman, about six miles. Was he able to keep it? He didn't keep it. He went in town the next morning and staked a claim on the alley of where the First National Bank is. <coughs> who was the main... I'd like to get some history of Norman. Like, who were the main people that started the town? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, Ed Johnson and uh, Henry Johnson. James D. McGuire. Tony Nolan. Uh, Marquette, M-A-R-Q-U-T, Frank McGinley, R.C. Berry, C.H. Bessent, uh, Abbott's, Downings, Capshaws, Hyde, uh, Briggs, Runyon, are you in YAN? Uh, Edwards, Howry, H O W E R Y, uh, The uh, Engel newspaper editor. There was a fellow named John Allen. He had a weekly paper, and uh, John would go down the street talking to himself. And some one of his friends stopped him, said, "John." Why is it that you always talk to yourself? John said, well, you know, I enjoy talking to a smart man and also like to hear a smart man talk. <laughs> but the uh, reason I mentioned about wagon yard politics, uh, the, uh, I was fortunate in this respect I was the youngest boy, four boys, four girls. And unfortunately, our mother died and left eight children from 15 months to 20. I was eight years old. My dad never did run from any office, but he was interested in what was going on. And a favorite place, a gathering spot, in Norman at that time was 300 block on East Main under a big cottonwood tree in the spring and summer. Men gathered there in the evening. In the winter time, we'd be in Hullamantier Hardware or Moffat's uh, repair shop or Mr. Flint's uh, barber shop, sometime over at McGuire's Hardware, sometime in one of the wagon yards. All, all the wagon yards then had a camp house in a place, gathering spot. 
And all I heard in being with my dad from the time I was eight until I was 15, politics and religion. And uh, the, uh, that's the reason I described it then as wagon yard politics. And 60 years ago, for instance, the two major planks in practically every candidate for office was farm relief, farm relief and reduced taxes. Well, they relieved the farmer and balloon taxes. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. And uh, I've had uh, an interest in those two areas all my life. When I was 22 years old, I was a Republican judge when Herbert Hoover defeated Al Smith. And uh, many people because of Al Smith being a Catholic, voted in that election for the first time. One woman, for instance, came in, she in her 60s, and she said, I don't know a thing in the world about voting, but I do know that I want to get a vote against that dirty, stinking Catholic and Al Smith. The prejudice and the hate engendered in that campaign caused me to change my registration to Democrat. And uh, I have uh, believed, and I introduced at the Democratic uh, County Convention in Norman, 1961, since we'd made strides in some areas of learning, but none in religion or politics, I suggested the county convention endorse the teaching of the story of religion. Not some trade name brand religion, but why did the, do the Mohammedans believe and live the way they do? The Hebrews, the Indians, how many people in the state of Oklahoma know anything about the spiritual belief of the Indians. Most of them have a different uh, uh, belief and teaching. And uh, the, uh, in the area of uh, politics, I think that politics should be taught beginning in the seventh grade. And if you have an interest in those two fields, Politics and religion plays the greatest impact on the lives of more people than all other subjects. And if you have and teach and cultivate an interest, we'd have better government and we'd have a, a better uh, people because there are many good organizations, uh, man conceived, but how many live it? Uh, and same is true in the, in the church. Well, here's my, uh, <coughs> if you don't mind, I'll read this. Okay. What is the church? The Lord loves his house more than all the dwellings of Jacob. His house, the church, is the body of Christ. If the members of his body are spiritual, the church will endure. If they are only flesh, they will perish. Greed, hate, and lust of the flesh are companions in destroying. Their life is brief. Spiritual works live and are a part of the eternal. Everyone proves self. Those who are members of the body are bought with a price, the life of Christ. The members who desert and betray the church are also bought with a price. They divorce from God through their own lusts. A man's foe shall be they of his own household. They love the flattery and sham of make-believe. One false member can pollute the whole body. Quarantine from truth, as I said, Quarantine from truth is the first hypo in witchcraft. He who fails to defend a friend from injury 
is as much at fault as he who commits the injury. At St. Ambrose, 339 to 397. Not one person defended the Christ in the mockery of a trial. Have you defended truth lately? Uh, one gutless newspaper editor of a one newspaper town can quarantine the people from truth. There, what has happened out here in this area? The 22nd day of January, a mobile home was moved joining church property on the south. It sticks over about six feet on church property. It's Indian land, and I'm responsible for those people having a place to live. The sewage runs out. It's not connected. runs out on the ground. I reported this to the county sheriff, and I told the deputy who came out, Les Brown, that this is a federal matter, and they'll have to notify the FBI. We have city government, we have county, we have state, we have federal. Yet, nothing has been done. This place was broken into, I quit counting, ten times. The law would come out and make pictures of the damages, and uh, one night, it broke in there and scattered approximately 200 books all over out here. It rained that night before I came out, ruined all of them. Uh, I had a funeral at May's Funeral Home on the 24th day of April, 1974. When we started to go in town, four city employees putting up damn street markers on land that my wife paid for. Well, I hear I was going to have a service for a precious friend, and I wasn't going to stop to get into an argument. When we came back, they'd put one right north of the church. And they'd put one up there by that two acres. It made a mistake of giving the American Legion. And she got on the phone. We have a, an extension. Finally, she found out that Ralph Brennell, he doesn't even live in the annexed area. And uh, I've known him all my life, known all of his damn family. He authorized the city of Norman. I got Crosby out here, the city manager, with Mr. C.M. Rosenfeld, Charlie Phillips, the commander of American Legion, and Carl Shadrick as a witness right there. The poverty racket, they had a poverty program, play program. He couldn't get any of them to work. It's work getting someone to work. They'd broken in, and they pried that south window with a tire tool, a little Volkswagen, got in there and had a party. The boy threw his old shorts over there south. So when I got the city manager out here with three witnesses, I told him about it. I said, my wife is just an old Indian woman. Paid for everything out here. We've never asked for an offer. We've never asked for anything from anybody except to worship God in spirit and truth. She suffered more and contributed the years and time and money. We've been vandalized, in trouble with trespassers, liars, and thieves. And I think the officials of the city of Norman owe her an apology. And I asked him, I said, did you ever hear of Jeremiah's girdle? He was hesitant, and he finally said, yeah. I went over and got those old filthy, good-for-nothing shorts and brought them and put them up before him. My opinion is that the city government of Norman is just like these damn filthy, good-for-nothing shorts. Rotten as hell. And I said, the Norman transcript will not publish a damn thing about the truth of what we experienced at Little Axe. 
and uh, nothing has been done about moving that. And all of it has been done. For instance, we severed our relation with the Methodist Church in 1958. Our last meeting with the bishop and Dr. D. D. Etchison and the lawyer, it's supposed to be our lawyer, but he wasn't. Maud gave the lawyer a cashier's check for $9,150. We were building and agreed to pay for everything and the finishing of the construction of all. There was a $7,500 mortgage from the Board of Missions in Philadelphia. And uh, I got the abstract up to date, 1965. Three liens had been filed that she had paid for from three to six weeks before. All of them were filed the 12th day of August, 1958. The $7,500 mortgage, now you make a guess how long it took to file that and release the $7,500 mortgage. How long? 33 months. And the legal profession and the religious racketeers gave Christ the most trouble in his ministry. I have had exactly the same experience. I detest religious racketeers and I don't have any use for a damn crooked lawyer. I was uh, before grand jury in Oklahoma County. And because I told the truth, a company started out to put me out of business. And uh, when the deputy brought, we were living in the city, when the deputy brought the notice of the suit, why uh, my wife, she was upset and it included her. She just tore that subpoena up, threw it in the wastebasket. Well, about uh, 10 days later, when I got home, well, I, I was supposed to appear before Carl, Judge Carl Traub. I didn't know anything about it. And uh, when she uh, got this subpoena about a default judgment being rendered, well, she hit the ceiling. When I got home that night, she said, we're going to uh, be in a lot of trouble because it tied up her land in Caddo County. And I asked her if it ever received a notice. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, what'd you do it? She tore it up. I went to see Judge Traub the next morning. And fortunately, he was an honest judge and an understanding man. And I explained the situation. He told me, well, you'll have to get an attorney and file for rehearing and state the reason. This extended over a period of two years. And the last appearance, I was on the witness stand, I had canceled checks for every dime that claimed that I owed. And uh, Judge Traub threw this out, set it aside. Well, then, when we, our abstract messed up, I got a, a friend told me that the best abstract attorney in Oklahoma City, so I called the man, and I asked him if he'd be interested in getting an abstract uh, cleared up in Cleveland County. He said, Mr. Reynolds, I wouldn't take a case in Cleveland County under any circumstances. His own word, that's the damnedest mixed up county in this state of Oklahoma. All right, I went over to Hicks Epton. Then he was the president of the Trial Lawyers Association of the United States and had the reputation of being an honest judge. So I showed him the facts, and it's in December. He said, Mr. Reynolds, said, let me clear my desk, and by the 1st of January, 
I'll have everything clear and I'll take this matter and the first thing I'm going to do is get this lawyer over at Norman, the first thing, disbarred from a practice of law the rest of his life. Went to Washington, he and his wife, over the holidays, and the poor man, God bless. Uh, Thirty years, conflict. And I'll tell you, if you got your thing on, my experience with many, many members of the clergy, they're the most gutless lot in America. My whole entire ministry of 32 years could be confined. Fifth chapter of Acts, 29th verse. Peter and the other apostles answering, we ought to obey God rather than men. And you cannot please men and at the same time God. I've shown uh, some of them just one chapter, and all of this is going to be published. Just one chapter, and you know what the response is? One weakling will say, oh, for pity's sake, Another one say, oh my goodness. But the rugged man who doesn't profess or claim to be holier than thou, his response is the son of bitches. And I agree with him. <laughs> See? How come they named the town Norman? It was after a surveyor that surveyed uh, the railroad for the Santa Fe. What are some of the spiritual beliefs of the Indian? Uh, the uh, Indian believes and practice earth, Mother Earth. And they learned that through the teaching from the book of Genesis, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. Most, many Indians are believed uh, in the spirit of the tree, the plant, everything that uh, crawls or creeps, and uh, they become a uh, believer. Well, let me show you. I'm glad you asked me that. When the New Deal started the program of destroying uh, foodstuff, livestock, 14 different commodities on the farm, uh, the Shawnees were producing practically all their own food. They had uh, good gardens, they had cotton, they had corn, they had pigs, hogs, horses, raised all their own ponies and some milk. Well, government man come out and say, on this place right here, raise good cotton and corn up there. Maybe cotton be knee high, mm -hmm. corn. The government man say, chief, how about buying half your cotton? First place, the Indian want to know, well, why you want to buy half my cotton? If the Indian agree, well, he say, well, you go ahead and plow my half up and I'll pay you for plowing. The Indian, in his own native belief, knew that a power greater than man helped to bring this up, and he was not going to be a party and destroy it. And all of them threw up their hands and quit tending the soil. In doing so, they lost a spiritual strength that can only be close to God. The greatest spiritual uh, songs of the South to the black man came out of the cotton fields of the South, the greatest spiritual. So there's not a better uh, part of eternity than in the spiritual values that comes from Mother. Mm -hmm. 
and instead of uh, the poverty racket. Uh, see, let me show you. The U.S. Congress established the War Department the 7th of August, 1789. 195 years ago, the 7th of this next month. All right. They assigned all Indian matters to the War Department. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is the oldest welfare state in the story of man. All right. On the other hand, the Freedmen's Bureau was set up to take care of the freed slaves. And it was the shortest lived bureau that I know of. If the Freedmen's Bureau was existing today with the same policies as the Indian Bureau, the black men and women would be dancing around a hot fire and singing hymns of hate against the white. They'd be painted up like something they were not. They'd, be, they'd have a shield in one hand and a spear in the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, those things, a conquered people seldom accept any of the virtues of the conqueror, but always the vices. Always the vices. And I was invited to Washington in 1961 in regard to Indian matters. My first appointment was with Secretary Abraham Ribica, Secretary of H.E.W. And uh, when I told him my purpose in being there, well, he, his first response, Mr. Reynolds, I don't know a thing in the world about the American Indian. And I said, well, Mr. Secretary, the first thing I want you to know, I'm in full accord with a prayer among our elders asking the great spirit to send back the ponies and take the asses and let it begin in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Dr. Carlos Montezuma, in my opinion, was one of the truly great American Indians, full blood Apache. And in the last century, a band of Pimas attacked a band of Apaches and uh, a Pima liked the looks of this little Carlos Montezuma, about five years old at the time. So he swooped down and picked him up, put him on his horse. And the Pimas kept this little boy. About three years later, a traveling photographer came along and made pictures. built for the tribe. What did your dad do? Is he um, still living? Yeah, this is July 25th, 1984. Mm -hmm. And what's your full name, sir? Ted. Ted Reynolds. Ted Reynolds. Built this first room. It had an opening the 12th of January, 1964. Mm-hmm. And now, who, who sponsored the library? Well, when I, had the, when I dug the footing for this library, I didn't have one penny. Hmm. And uh, Now, it's the Walter Hart, L. Hart Library? Walter L. Hart. Now, who was Walter Hart? Walter L. Hart was a very precious friend, lived at Paul's Valley. And uh, so, uh, we built this room recently. Here was the first room in on the lot. The reason we logged this up, this was broken into ten times when I quit counting and had to log it up. The lake attracted an element of people. Yeah. 
and uh, they'd break in sometime, just have a party. And this was a picture the first year we were here, mm -hmm. 1952. Wife Caddo, and she had land out in Caddo County. Government took the surface to build that dam out of Port Cobb. Well, she gave two acres to the American Legion, which was a tragic mistake. This fellow, Charlie Phillips, was a commander and organizer of the post, knowing him all my life. But as soon as they got to building with the racketeers, put Charlie out. And uh, this is one of our many weddings. Mm -hmm. We've given a uh, More than 10,000 books away. What are you collecting these days in the way of... Well, I, I tell you, uh, here's something you like. Oh. This is my report card. Seventh grade report card. Sadie Hyde. You remember Herbert K. Hyde? I've heard the name. Herbert K. Hyde was the best United States District Attorney in the Western District. Mm -hmm. This was his sister. Hmm. And see the year? 1918-1919. Then here's my... Uh, This is my first grade. Alice Eskew was your teacher? Mm hmm The stars then, you attend Sunday school regularly for a month and put a gold star. I'm against prayer in the public schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you read about the mess they had with the Little Axe School some time ago? I uh, remember some. What was the cause of all that? Some of the shallow denominationalists wanted to brand all the kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the trade name brand religion. And uh, I would judge, since my family had been in the teaching profession for 200 years, that uh, today, 62, you can go to the thing there. I was going to get this photograph. Oh, that's a picture of my mother and her sister. Hmm. Mm -hmm. She was born 14th of May. 1874 and, and he took Carlos Montezuma to Chicago enrolled him in public school graduated from high school, worked his way through medical school. He worked out his internship with the public service, Indian Health, He's on several reservations. When he realized the rottenness of the Bureau, he wrote to a friend in Chicago and told him he was thinking about resigning. Come back to Chicago and hang out with his Shingle. He wanted to know what his friend thought about it. He wrote back to Dr. Carlson and told him, said, well, doctor, you might be the best surgeon in the world, but remember, you're Indian. He said, if you return to Chicago, you'll have to fight prejudice. He said that when he read that, well, his Apache blood rushed to his head, and he said, with God's help, I'll go back and fight prejudice. Well, he taught in two medical schools, 
and he wrote what I consider the greatest Indian paper, Let My People Go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got it in there. If you want to put it on tape, I'd like to read it. Would you mind? Sure. All right. Let me run and get it. But said that if you play along with him, uh, he'll put you at the top. That's true. And I said, what you mean is uh, sell out and destroy every principle by which you live. Mm -hmm. And just like when I was on the, before the grand jury, why Scanlon was the county attorney, Oklahoma County, and when he started questioning me, I said, Mr. County Attorney, I'm positive you don't know anything about my business dealings through the State Board of Public Affairs. And if the jury will permit, I'll relate in detail with the understanding you may cross-examine me from now until doomsday because I'll not lie to or for any man. So I was before the jury for a couple of hours and immediately after I was dismissed, he rushed to the phone and called Johnston Murray. Johnston Murray's the governor then. To get him to come voluntarily to counteract the effect that I had on the jury. And uh, this extended over a period of several weeks. And they voted 14 indictments, but split six and six. So it's just a whitewash. And... Uh, that's why the reason that the company started out to sue me. But I uh, made many enemies, some very powerful. But if the Lord would roll back the film of my life for a rerun, mm -hmm. knowing myself, I'd end up with the same damned enemies and very, very few friends. See? What was the grand jury called for? Or to invest, uh, to investigate a city government, and county government, state government yeah. in Oklahoma County. Yeah. And, uh, but the, uh, I'll find this. Where did you meet your wife? Uh, she came, I was living by myself, had a, Place this side of Norman, five and a half miles, had 20 acres. Wonderful place, beautiful place. Raised practically all my own food, beef and pork and poultry and uh, garden stuff, fine orchard, berries, grapes, and uh, single. So she came and to. Uh, work for me and that's how we got acquainted and but talking about being drunk I hadn't had anything to drink in about six years and uh, I sh I'm like Leon Hatfield he's won the top-notch newspaper he was we were drinking together and he raised up his drink said Ted you know the drink that never hurt me? The one that I didn't take. <laughs> and it's true, see? <laughs> anyway, got drunk, stayed drunk eight months. Moved my earthly possession in the wheelbarrow. Best thing that ever happened to me. It's how we face circumstance. And I only had one place to look. I uh, disgraced my family, my brothers and sisters, and so on, and only had uh, God to look up to. So, went to Houston, stayed a while, went to Lawton, came back to the city, got some work back out to Capitol, got straightened up. And I was overdrawn to the bank, and I went to the bank and told the vice president that I wanted him to shake hands, the biggest ass he'd ever shake hands with. He said, Ted, I've always loved you. He said, I couldn't imagine what had happened to you. 
Did, but when checks started coming in, were you cashing checks? And he said, you have never told me one thing about borrowing money and when to pay it back. You'd pay it back before or on that date. And said the credit through Bradstreet and Dunn, unlimited. I said, well, I'm going to recognize my debt to the bank and I'm going out to capital and get some work and I'll repay the bank within 30 days. And they did. And uh, she got out looking for a church to go to and found a little frame building down on Southeast 16th and Byers. Uh, White Parker, one son of Quanta Parker, was a pastor. I wasn't interested. But the next Sunday, she was on the front row and I was on the back. But over a period of time, the pastor and his wife and the congregation just absorbed us. Well, I made a lot of money and I was throwing a lot of money away. And uh, so I told her that let's start supporting this church. <clears throat> we did. And they asked us to whatever they'd ask us to do, and that's what we do. And uh, we were camped down at Sealy Chapel, uh, Chickasaw and Choctaw Church, Southeast of Veda, when the Lord called me to teach. We need more teaching and less preaching. My shining uh, example of preaching is the Jones that led more than 900 people to commit suicide. And uh, there are only three kinds of religion. Give, give me, and grab. And the give me and the grabbers are in the majority. I don't care about what a person professes in the way of religion. But the most wonderful wedding was the 11th of last March. The parents of the bride were Pentecostal holiness. Her dad was a Pentecostal holiness preacher, converted to Judaism. The groom was Jewish, converted to Buddhism. So they, uh, the bride's mother types for me. They were asking, well, who could they get? So her mother told them, said, well, I bet you can get Ted out of the little axe. And so they came out and visited a couple of times. I gave them the Methodist ritual for uh, burials and consecration, dedication, matrimony, marriage, and so on. So they picked out what would be fitting. And there were people, Jewish, Buddhist, many different faiths, from a number of different states, Catholic, also. Well, the best man read a poem by Pasternak to start with. Then, uh, the finish of it was that uh, I wrote a piece to the finish of it. But anyway, there was the greatest spirit of unity among all those people, from the little ones to those in the evening of life, that I have I've never experienced a greater spirit of unity. And that, to me, was a challenge for the whole of mankind. See? I, uh, you mentioned that you had the true story of Norman on the telephone. Yes. Um, was Norman a pretty bad city when it first started? Well, uh, you must consider that it wasn't but a few years uh, since the war between the states. And many people were in a state of flux. 
many people came and made the run with the purpose and intention of establishing their home and staying. Some, like uh, a boom town, uh, they didn't expect to stay very long. And uh, the uh, ones who stayed, uh, stayed because uh, they had the breeding or ge genetics and the training from childhood. I might uh, compare it to this. I voted for paramutual betting. I don't gamble. But I thought a, mu a few people might learn that champions comes out of breeding and the early training, and it should apply to the human race. And uh, the ones who stayed, they had character. And uh, the ones who didn't, left in a short time, uh, just damn poor breeding. And uh, my family uh, came to this country on my dad's side in 1622 from England. The name Reynolds means powerful dominion, Anglo-Saxon. I inherited from my British side courage and from my, my mother's side uh, compassion. My oldest brother, eight children, four of us, with the characteristics of her dad, four are mother, four Republicans, four Democrats, four left-handed, four right-handed. And uh, the early years of my life, of course, uh, I was influenced both my, by my dad and my mother. My mother, up until this present moment, the greatest influence for good in my life, human influence. And uh, you can, I can show in our family, I spent more than 50 years gathering material about our family. I got a damn uh, nephew that uh, graduated from University of Phi Beta Kappa and uh, he was ordained in the Episcopal Church, his priesthood. I told Maud how I was going to greet him. And when he came by, I told him, Nephew, I'll call you brother, but I'll be damned if I call you father. And I can't, I can't think of a, a sorry damned louse. And it comes in his damn breeding on the other side and the lack of training when he's brought up. It doesn't make a bit of difference to me. In my own family, a man's foe shall be they of his own household. My brother knew that if he violated his oath of the office, he's on the school board, he's on the city commission, he was mayor, when he ran for mayor, 14 candidates. He got more votes than all the rest of them. He knew more people in this county than anyone, and most of them a personal uh, relation. He knew that if he violated an oath of office, the cardinal principle of good government is to uphold right and expose wrong. He knew that if I learned about it, I'd be the first one to expose it. And I've lived that all my life. I don't give a damn who the, I don't give a damn what lodge he belongs to, brotherhood, church. If he proves himself to be a louse, I'll expose it. And that isn't a very popular stance. <laughs> See? What about your childhood? Uh, my, uh, since I was the youngest boy, I had a sister five, my youngest sister 15 months. And a uh, wonderful childhood. The love and compassion, my mother, that and my older uh, sister uh, could not be equaled anywhere. What was your mother's name? Callie, Carolina Brannon. Brannon. And uh, her 
my great-grandparents on her side, Julian Brannan, born 1809 on Hanging Dog Creek, Cherokee County, North Carolina. Mary Elizabeth Gadd, uh, born on Hanging Dog Creek, 1812. The reason they named it Hanging Dog, that's all Cherokee country. And after a flash flood, they found a dog hanging in the fork of a tree. So that's how it got its name, Hanging Dog. And uh, he was a minister, and I've been down there three times, and uh, been right where the he ministered up near uh, in the mountains, Coker Creek, and uh, the. Uh, one thing, I'm glad you asked me that because my older brothers, here's what had an impact on my life. We always had boxing gloves. And uh, kids growing up then, most of them had to provide and make their own uh, uh, recreation and entertainment. Kids would take buggy wheels, baby buggy wheels, and make carts, and this and that and the other. And they'd find a cable somewhere and stretch it from a tall tree out to, and get a tub handle and slide down that. And they had uh, many different games. The kids don't play today. But we did have boxing gloves. And since I was the youngest, why, when other boys were not there to spar and box. Well, my brothers used me for kind of a punching bag. But by the time I was 12, 14 years old, I made up my mind that when I got old enough, big enough, I'd beat hell out of all of them. And I did. And there's not a... a kid in Norman, weighing 118 pounds to 135 pounds, I could beat hell out of any kid. Uh, one summer, when I was 17 years old, between junior and senior class, working on a job out near the university, there was a carpenter on a job named Stone. He spent all summer during noon hour before he started work, telling about his son Harvey whipping every kid in Oklahoma City. And he worked as messenger boy in the summertime. And messenger boys years ago used to be pretty tough kids. Had to be in the cities. All right, let me show you. I had to train year-round in order to play football. And... Uh, the last year of high school, well, this Harvey Stone was in the English class right after noon. I was on the front, on the back seat, and Harvey's up on the front seat. Omar Bass over here threw an eraser and hit Harvey before the teacher came in. He thought it was me. So Harvey came back and jumped onto me, and I shoved him off away from me tore a 50 cent blue shirt. Jeanette Langford, the teacher, walked in and made him take his seat. Well, I forgot all about it. So I went out to football practice and I got home about 6.30 and one of my sisters told me that two boys there to see me. I said, well, did you know them? He said, well, Bill Corbett was one of them. Bill Corbett was younger, I mean an older boy, and he'd been out watching football practice. He wanted to see a fight. He told his Harvey, he said, oh, anybody can whip Ted. And he stayed with him because he wanted to see a fight. And so a few minutes later, we're here, Bill Corbett and Harvey Stone came. I went outside in the yard, and Harvey told me I was going to pay him for that blue shirt. I said, well, I'm not going to pay you. You jumped on to me, and I shoved you off. So he said, well, you'll either pay me or I'll take it out of your hide. 
I said, well, Harvey, if you really want to whip me, let's go out in the alley. He said, no, I want to whip you right here in your yard. Well, he wore glasses, and he took his glasses off and turned them around to give him Bill Corbett. When he came back around, he soaked me with his right hand fist right there in my eye, and this felt like came out like this. And I told him, I said, Harvey, I didn't want to fight you, but I'm going to assure you I'm going to beat your damned head off. Well, the time we got through fighting, there were probably 300 people, and we fought a period of cost me four to five minutes. We'd stop and rest. My dad is right on the front porch. And uh, when I got to wearing Harvey down, I was in tip-top condition. He wasn't. When I got to wearing him down, I'd hit him and turn him halfway around, and he'd come back around, I'd hit him and turn him the other way. We were as bloody as two butchered hogs. Shirt torn off, blood running down. Finally, Harvey said, that, well, I've got enough. I said, well, come on in the house, clean up. No, I'm not going to. Went next door, people let him. The next morning, I met him in school, hall, and I walked up to him and offered to shake hands. I had a whopper of a black eye, he always. Both his eyes black, his nose spread like this, his upper lip touched his nose, his bottom lip coming up. He said, no, it's not over with yet. I said, well, Harvey, you should know one thing. I've got your number. I didn't want to fight you, but I knew that if we got into it, I'd beat your head off because I'm in tip-top condition. Well, that taught me the greatest lesson in the world about being in condition. The next day, a man named Robertson that worked in oil fields and lost his one arm in the oil field, he lived catty-cornered from us on the corner, moved from down by uh, uh, west of Ardmore. I was going to town after school, walking with a girl, and he stopped me. We were right there in front. He said, Ted, said, I want to tell you something. He said, I sat right here. I had a ringside seat for that fight you had with that kid yesterday. He said, I've been in the oil field, been in gang fights, been in saloons and saw street fights and of all kinds champion fight. Never, never, never did I see such a fight as you and that boy had. Said that was the best. People talked about that fight for years. I fought in the preliminaries, the American Legion. My dad, he encouraged me to fight when I was a small boy growing up, but then when I got to really fight, he, he didn't want me because I'd end up with scars and everything. But uh, it taught me a great lesson. Every sport, I would say that 75% of the injuries due to a boy not being in condition, or girl. Uh, my son played uh, football four years in high school, two years over at Cameron, two years in the uh, made All-American Forces Guard in Europe and semi-pro football and so on. When his junior year in high school, big, I told him he wasn't in top condition. I told him, I said, Teddy, if I was your, had your weight when I was in high school uh, and uh, tip-top condition, I'd have been the meanest damn player on the field. But I said, don't you make the mistake of thinking you can be mean unless you're in tip-top condition. You're going to get your head beat off. <laughs> See? See? 
Do you remember World War One? Yes, Sam. Did you do any work for the war effort? Collecting materials or anything? or The war effort? Yeah, you know, people collecting old tires or metal. Or oh, whatever. yeah. Kids uh, got copper and brass, rags, bottles, and sold to junk dealers. And uh, the... Uh, I gathered, uh, I found uh, one of those big brass spit tunes, about like that, over on the west side of Norman. Carried it way over on the east side, just a young boy. But I figured I'd get two or three dollars. Brought it to Tom Delback. He turned it up, bottom up and took a hatchet and hit that bottom and it had about four inches of sand in it. Oh. <laughs> I got about 12, 15 cents and I carried that clear across town. Was he the main guy that bought the metal? Tom Dale back and had a, a Jew named Hackstein that bought rags and bottles and copper and zinc and uh, brass and all metals that they could use. What about the Depression, 1930s? What did you do in those? We lived, uh, during Depression, uh, the scale for skilled craftsmen was 50 cents an hour. Common labor, 25 cents. I live in 1930 and 31 down on the river on my brother's place, waiting for a job to get ready over at Taft, Muskogee County. The state, Bill Murray's governor, built that mental institution and moved a black from uh, Fort Supply and uh, Veneta and Norman. We had the painting on that job. We used more than 70,000 pounds of oil-based paint. And uh, the scale, painters came from all over the United States. 50 cents an hour, common labor, 25 cents. I have the time books in there from those years. Well, before we went over there, the white people in this area had to go to Norman to get Red Cross flour, uh, whatever they could get. Well, by the time they'd get in Norman, the people in Norman and near Norman, they'd know when a box card come in and it'd all be gone for these people. So we had a meeting up at Red Hill School one Sunday afternoon. I told them they wanted me to. I'd arranged to get to distribute out here. And of course they all wanted me to. So I went in the next morning, and Fred Tarman, editor of Norman Transcript, Ted Weedman, manager of Oklahoma Gas and Electric, Ms. Hogan, head of the Red Cross. I told them the situation. They said, well, Ted, you've got a job, but you won't get any pay and you'll have to arrange for the transportation. Jess Todd was the county commissioner, so I got him to give Everett Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-D, $6 a day for the use of his team and wagon. Everett was the best tenant farmer out here, raised all of his own stock, work animals, riding ponies. We'd leave out here at 7 o'clock in the morning, get to Norman about noon, unhitch, give the horses a block of hay, water them at the courthouse, get a 10-cent bowl of chili, a nickel cup of coffee, then we'd load up, we'd get back out here about seven. 207 white families, nine rural school districts. I didn't get one copper cent, and I didn't expect to get one. When we got over to Taft, the welfare, the poverty racket was handled by a colored lawyer living in Muskogee named Jones. His friends were getting all the gravy. So after I found out who is who and how come, well, I, I asked Henderson Urey to go and talk to the principal of the school and see if we'd get the use of the school that Friday night and told him the reason we wanted to use it. So Henderson came back, and he's all glad that Prince wasn't tired. 
So I told the people, the first meeting, 115 of them, that I was in sympathy with their uh, situation, and I'd suggest they appoint a committee to go in and file a protest with the county commissioners. They appointed a committee of seven, and they had me on the committee. Well, a political kingpin named Judge Lowe got up and he gave me the devil. And he said, if you follow this young man, you'll find this institution on our south to be controlled completely by whites. This institution on our north will be controlled completely by whites. And I can only see trouble, trouble, trouble for my people. The way they applaud, stomping your feet. And so when he got through, I said, Judge Law, I want to thank you for your opposition. I've never attempted to accomplish anything unless I expected opposition. Because without opposition, whatever you accomplish doesn't amount to very much. Well, uh, I was going to. So then they said, no, we'll just add Judge Lowe. So they just added Judge Lowe, and that was all there was to it. Well, we got the whole thing changed, set up. I went in town. One time I had an old panel truck, got 25 bundles of blankets and clothing, 25 different families. One meeting, why a girl led her grandpa, he was 83 years old, down to meet me after the meeting's over. And he told me, tears running down his cheek, that I was the first man who ever talked to them with the spirit uh, in proving that I was in sympathy with their suffering. I told him, I never think of your color unless you mention it yourself. And so I reached in my hand, in my pocket, and gave him a dollar. Tears run down his cheek. Another interesting thing, a teacher named Simmons, one of the meetings, what they were praising me and thanking me for me being from Norman, where they didn't permit colored folks. He said, I've observed, Mr. Reynolds, we were buying milk from him. He said, I appreciate what he's been able to do, and I want you to know that we drank milk from the same cow, and I hope to continue to do so for many years to come. <laughs> Isn't that something? Anyway, they showed me more appreciation for my effort than all the whites and all the Indians combined. Out of 207 families that I was hauling years ago, two men thanked me. I've traveled more than 400,000 miles, black, red, and white. Cussed every mile, man, and blessed every foot by God. Mm -hmm. I don't owe anyone an apology for my ministry, and uh, I've had enough to make the same preacher cuss, and God knows at times I have cussed. Not that I'm glad of it, but when you consider that when the Lord chose 12, nine of them working men, three of them professional, Judas Iscariot was a shyster lawyer. He is a Moabite in Kirov, a fishing village. They had a law school at Kirov. The Moabites were descendants from Lot and his oldest daughter. That's the reason you have the expression, sorry lot. Matthew was a publican, a tax collector. Luke was a doctor. Three professional men and nine working men. And they were 
uh, rough seaman, and I know what sea life is, and uh, they cussed, and uh, after they they were convicted and converted, well, I'm sure that uh, much of that was washed away. But if you would uh, give 32 years of your life, and uh, during those 32 years only have, uh, you might say, three times off, and uh, end up, I uh, have that pickup out there, and I have to refinance it to pay the insurance. I owe the bank uh, $500 on an open note. Maud land over in Caddo County I made the government let her keep the mineral. And she sold a lease. And she spent over $100,000 in the last three years right here. This. Library. This, everything is a ripoff. This gravel from here to the church, $6,000. That upper part of that little room out there, I already had that floor, ran that concrete years ago and had the block wall up there. The only thing was just the walls and that roof. That little porch and porch here and porch on the other side. This guttering is all separate. That's $14,000. And uh, this, $55,000. And uh, we've never asked for an offering. We've taken up offering for church uh, over at Franklin burned, struck by lightning, old frame building, been built many years, and I called over there when I learned it had been struck by lightning and offered, would bring an offering over the next Sunday afternoon. And if they built back, I would paint it all the inside. Well, I was working for the Norman Board of Education in order for us to live, and uh, I'd leave my job at 4.30 when it got ready and paint till midnight, sometime 2 o'clock in the morning. No one offered to help me any. And uh, I told my boss, circumstances, a little bit before Christmas, they wanted to have it finished by Christmas Eve for their program. And I told my boss, he said, Ted, are you donating your work out there? I said, sure. And a friend of mine furnished the paint. He said, will you knock off and uh, you just go ahead and finish that out there. Well, I gave him 80 hours. Hard work and unusual hours. Do you think that they thank me? Not at all. And I had to remind the fellow years later that I'd like to have a letter recognizing that I painted and gave them 80 hours under very unusual circumstances. See? The, uh, I had a fellow call me one Sunday morning. He said, Ted, uh, I just feel like I'd like to come and give a testimony. I said, well, that'd be good. Well, I had a Ford Galaxy and good tires on it and running pretty good. So he came and gave wonderful testimony. The next uh, week or so, uh, he and his wife wanted to buy that Ford. And they asked me if I'd hold a check for six weeks. I said, will you pay me in six weeks? They said they would. 
I didn't transfer the title, but I let them have the car. A 16-year-old boy, he tore the car up, and when the six weeks was up, I gave him two more days, called him. He said, well, go ahead and send the bank and see what happened. Well, it happened. It's hot. See? But he gave fine testimony. Then I had another fellow come and say, say, Ted, old so-and-so got saved. I said, well, that's good. Said, yeah, he quit drinking and smoking. I said, how about lying and stealing? He, some people set them up on a, self on a pedestal because they don't drink or don't smoke. I'd rather have a dozen drunks than one liar. But I know, because I know those drunks can be sobered. I've seen it. But only God can bridle a lying tongue. One of the greatest uh, prayer meetings I ever had. People left an old boat up there, north of the church. Indian, white man, lived in the city. Said he'd get it next week. Well, he didn't, left it two months. I had to move it every time I moved. So about two months later, why uh, she and the husband and uh, another Indian came by, and they were drunk, the two men were drunk. So I'd forgotten about having a funeral for them, the little girl. And this fellow said, he started crying, Crying drunk, he said, Ted, said, I need God. Tears run down his cheek. I said, we all need God. And he said, well, I, I need him right now. I said, well, if you want to pray? I said, if you want to get on the straight line, no party line, we'll just kneel down here and have prayer. We knelt down by that boat, hot summer night. I don't believe in these long prayers. Very brief prayer. Both of those men as sober as you are. The Indian, to prove that they meant business, he reached in his pocket and handed me twenty dollars. <laughs> See, uh, why can't people uh, be honest? Some people will lie rather than tell the truth. I've been uh, uh, poison squad. And I tell anyone that I don't have any cover-ups. From the time I was born, it's present out. When were you called to the ministry? In 1951. When did you first realize it? Uh, to be truthful, completely truthful, I believe I should have entered the ministry in my 20s. I was uh, in the university, early 20s. Uh, here in Normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, about 20 years old, 1924. Yeah, 1924. And uh, I was in love with a girl. She was a senior in high school. I was intending to be a newspaperman, a journalist, and a good one. And uh, her dad was managing editor, Norm Transcript, heavy drinker, 
they were getting out a special edition and he's down there at the paper off on a drunk two or three o'clock in the morning so I'd take a section of step ladder down there and put up over the back of the and she'd come out a window and we'd stay out late and uh, eight nights straight well I had an eight o'clock class to meet the eighth night we went sleep in Lincoln school Jander woke us up rattling the door at six o'clock in the morning in February. Went home, all the lights were on, upstairs and downstairs. The old man shrunk. He asked me, Ted, what is it between you and Bernard? I said, we're in love with one another. Would you marry us? Well, I was hesitant because thinking about finishing school. And I said, well, yes, I would. Yes, you would if you're forced. Told his wife, get, Myrtle, get your coat on. We're going to a wedding. Took the girl upstairs and stayed up there. And about 30 minutes later, he told me, he said, Ted, we're not going to have a wedding. Eight o'clock, you take that lighter and get it out of this yard. And don't you ever come in this house again. Well, I went home carrying this lighter, kids seeing me. My dad met me out in the yard and asked me where I'd been. I told him. Went in the house and started packing my things. He followed. Asked me what he was going to do. I said, I'm going out to the university and withdraw from school. I'm going to leave tonight. And uh, that's what happened. Well, that's a mistake in facing circumstance. I went to Houston, got on a ship, tanker, and started going to sea. But I really, I should have uh, entered the ministry in my 30s. But here's the difference in the ministry. No man can be wedded to God in spirit and serve God with a complete heart and be married to flesh. A man married regardless if he's a bartender, ditch digger, truck driver, merchant, or thief. 25% of his time is centered on his wife, his effort, his labor, in her behalf. It'll average 10% for each child. God expects 100%. And... Uh, I would be, uh, I wouldn't fit in in any church in Bartlesville or Norman, Oklahoma City. I've been privileged to speak in different churches one time, uh, several times up in Kansas, several different churches. And I was over at Whit Memorial, Tulsa, for a week. Wonderful time. But, uh, the work that God sent me here to do, I finished. And uh, there'll be more people convicted after I'm buried right up there and converted than all the 32 years I've been here. And that's one of the prices of paying in making a sacrifice. sacrifice. The, uh, I know more about Maud's tribe than any Caddo. I know about, more about the Shawnee than any Shawnee because I spent years and years and years in study and research. You say you went to sea on a tanker. Mm -hmm. What did you do in the ship? I was a mess boy to start with. And uh, then... I was on a, uh, had nine officers to wait on. What kind of ship, what kind of tanker was it? Standard oil. Oil tanker? Yeah. This is in the 20s? 25. 25. It, it carried around 80,000 barrels of oil. Where did you travel mainly? Where? Yeah. 
Uh, this trip, we went from Houston to Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania, down the Delaware River from Philadelphia, and uh, carried oil. Then we left uh, Marcus Hook and went through the canal up to San Pedro, California, and took on 80,000 barrels of gasoline. Then we brought the gasoline back uh, to Edgewater, New Jersey. And, uh, w but I traveled on uh, merchant ships and uh, tankers, luxury liners, and uh, I've worked on deck, never worked below, but I've been a quartermaster. And uh, the, if I was in the State Department, Washington, or the Foreign Office in London, I would get more truth from seamen going to sea than you'd get from all the damned uh, diplomatic corps. Because uh, we've had a gun running, smuggling operation in all of Latin America all of this century. In 1925, you could buy a Browning machine gun, black market, for $180. And Mercado was a ruler in Cuba. He'd get $1,000, any kind of gun, ammunition. And another thing, every Latin American country has had gun legislation years and years and years. And I told people if I was uh, some of the leaders of those countries, I damn sure wouldn't want people to be armed either. See? And the Catholic Church, I don't say this to be critical of the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church, and I've told it in their service, is responsible for 50% of the mess in, throughout all of Latin America. Uh, the uh, uh, Cuba, for instance, I was on a sugar boat. We were anchored out in the Havana Harbor, three weeks, waiting for the price of sugar to drop. And we went to a little place near the east coast of Guantanamo called La Gloria. And raw sugar, each sack weighing 325 pounds. There's Cuban longshoremen Caught all day long, 325 pound sack on their back. Uh, top wages, $4. And uh, the, uh, soon as you, soon as we hit uh, Pano, I mean, Havana Harbor, bum boats come out, or any Latin American country, bum boats the first to greet the ship ask if you have any guns or ammunition, shell, any kind. It's making difference what kind of it. The uh, people were exploited by the sugar and tobacco interest. But where Mercado made his state mistake, because he left the gambling and the dope and the prostitution move into Havana and take over. And that gave uh, Castro uh, the best uh, reason and excuse to Overthrow him. Mm -hmm. Castro was uh, captured once and they sentenced him to the firing squad, but because he's brought up as a Catholic, where the Catholic Church had enough influence to get him turned loose. Uh, the, uh, I've got a picture. I've gathered uh, many interesting things from places all over the world. And uh, I was on a ship, a fella, I thought he was my friend. We paid off in Philadelphia and went broke in the jewelry store auction. I'd wired home to my sister to let my dad know. So 
we were staying at Siemens Institute and went broke in the jewelry store auction. One went back to Siemens Institute and unwrapped a fleet of bought all of it in ten cent stores. But there we were, had about four dollars between us. So I bundled mine up and sent one of my sisters. We started Holborn, Philadelphia, in February. And uh, put in jail five times. First place, Clarksburg, West Virginia, riding on the blinds of the National Limited, fastest train on the Baltimore and Ohio, New York, St. Louis. We got into Clarksburg about 1.30 in the morning, and the tunnel, the last tunnel we went through, we learned in the jail was seven eighths of a mile long. Well, this is coal burners and fog and smoke, fog and and we rode right up to the station, and they'd wired ahead, and five laws greeted us, took us to freight office, searched us, took us to prison jail of the colored fellow playing solitaire. He looked up and asked us what we in for, and we told him. He said, the squire will give you about 60 to 90 days on the chain gang for riding on that fast train. Well, we had to go up before the judge, the squire, that afternoon, that was 1.30 in the morning. We had our discharge, we had our passport, we thought we had a good reason to be on that fast train. But judge listened to our story, and uh, he gave us eight days. And uh, the lesson that I learned, 115 in the jail, murders, counterfeiters, thieves, prostitutes, about every charge. And the ones the prisoners be tested then was what they called belly starvers, men who had deserted their wives and children. And today, why well, they're they're honored. Right. See, I'd like to get some background of the Caddo Indians, Caddo tribe. Uh, Caddo's were down in uh, what is now Louisiana, in Arkansas, for the last six hundred years. The Caddo's, like most of the Southeast Indians, uh, what's termed the five civilized tribes, they like timber. They like water, either lake or stream. And the Plains Indians, they'd rather be out on the open. And a lot of that's because they uh, fear of being attacked by enemy. And uh, the Caddo's, cultivated and stayed settled, similar to the five civilized tribes, and they had uh, many good uh, uh, traits that were helpful to them. The Cherokees uh, considered, and I agree, the most intelligent. The reason for it, they stayed put. And uh, they worked. They owned slaves. The five civilized tribes all owned slaves. And I'll show you the difference in the treatment after the war. The five civilized tribes had to put their slaves on the tribal roll. And they were allotted the same as the tribal member. And uh, the uh, tobacco, for instance. Tobacco in its native habitat, uh, the Carolinas and uh, eastern Tennessee and portions of Kentucky and the tip of Georgia, the Indians never used tobacco to smoke until after the sun went down. 
they would chew it during the day, but never smoke. And the reason, after the sun go down, they had smoked never more than four times. But they believed that this smoke outside uh, would keep the evil spirit away. And uh, the uh, another thing about them is uh, my grandmother, Grandpa was a drunkard, and Grandma made a living. She took in washing, ironing, made harmony in season, made bluing, and sold it because most of the people had to do their own washing, laundry, poor people. All right, she would never tell anyone how did she make bluing. In Western Carolinas, in Eastern Tennessee, and in Vietnam, a plant called indigo. They boil the root of the indigo plant to make bluing. Her friends and relation would keep her in roots in Norman. She would make blue it and sell little bob 15 cents. And uh, the suffering that my grandmother made and endured, she was skinned out of 240 acres of land in Monroe County by a crooked lawyer in Norman named John Franning and a son of a bitch in Madisonville, Monroe County, named Mitchell. Where was that? Monroe County. Eastern Tennessee. Tennessee. Uh, the, uh, in 1891, John Franning, this crooked lawyer Norman, it wasn't hard to get Grandpa drunk because Grandpa liked to drink. But he influenced Grandma to give John Franning and Mitchell, attorney in Madisonville, Monroe County, power of attorney. Skinned her out. I heard that as a little boy growing up. And I didn't learn the truth about it until about 15 years ago when I was down there. And I walked over the land. I've got a piece of rock that I picked up out of the mountain stream running. One of the women of the cattle was brought to Oklahoma. Well, from Texas, they were forced. Uh, when Sam Houston helped to establish the Republic of Texas, there was great enmity among many white people against the Indian. And uh, the legislature voted that provided for the removal of all Indians from the Republic of Texas. All right, the Caddo uh, tribe had been friendly to Sam Houston, the Cherokees and the Delawares were also friendly. Okay. They were all treated, all Indians, whether friend or foe, they were treated the same. They forced them to leave. And the uh, Caddo's came up and were over on uh, Cobb Creek, Caddo County, and uh, Binger, west of Anadarko, all in there. And uh, Maud's people, they were on Cobb Creek, 
They liked to be on a creek. They had big timber and uh, good at about tending to their land. And what year were they moved up here? Uh, I've got it in there. It's last uh, century, later part of last century. But I've got all the material about the. What about the? Trunk. What kind of? Are the cattle involved in the Native American church at all? Some of them, a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kiowas, the Comanches, and Cheyennes, Rapahoes, a few of them. What language do the cattle speak? It's a Caddoan. Uh, it's a mixture of the uh, uh, Caddo and some Delaware. Mm -hmm. The uh, Charles Journey Cake was one of the chiefs of the Delawares. The Delawares and Caddo get along pretty good. The uh, Osage were about the meanest tribe. They fought everybody, Osage. And uh, but Charles Journey Cake was one of the chiefs, and he wrote a piece that's on the cornerstone of the chapel over at Bacon. Reads, we have been broken up and moved six times. We thought when we moved across the Missouri River into Kansas, we were safe. But in a few years, the white man wanted our country. We had big barns, we had schools, we had churches where we listened to the same gospel the white man listens to. But the white man drove away our horses and cattle. And if our people followed them, they were killed. We try to forget those things. But we could never forget the blessed gospel of Christ. This more than repays us for all we have suffered. Do you know a greater forgiveness? No. Nope. See? The greatest Christian I know are, are Indians. How many letters in the Caddo alphabet? Do they have a, a structured alphabet like? No, uh, in a sense they do, but here's your here's your trouble about your translation. It takes from two to four words in Indian to express one word in English. Mm -hmm. There are many uh, things in the, like clothing. Well, silk, cotton, nylon, in Indian, it's all called just rag. And uh, the uh, there's a lot of trouble caused in misinterpreting. The first few years, we had a number of elderly people who didn't understand very much English, and they depended on some of their family to interpret. And one fellow was misinterpreting to his mother. So when I had the opportunity, I told him, now I don't care about you telling your mother so long as you stick with the truth and you've been lying to her and it confuses her in her own mind. Well, one reason why we never ask for an offering among Indians, if a minister, man of God, if he goes overboard about passing the offering plate, in the interpretation, 
from the English to the Indian mind, older Indians say, he wants you to give your heart to God, but give your pocketbook to him. So we never ask for no. Another reason is, four people give willingly, one person give grudgingly. This person giving grudgingly contaminates the entire offering. Wouldn't rather not accept it. And uh, the, uh, I told a story about a fellow was invited to speak at a church and people had moved away and died and not many left, and so when he got to this church, not many there, so he preached a little while, he turned around and asked one deacon, and said, do you have an offering plate? He said, well, I'll look for it, couldn't find it. He said, well, just go ahead and take my hat. So he passed his hat around, brought it back, looked in it, empty. Let's all pray. He said, Lord, you know these people a lot better than I do. And I just thank you, Lord, that I got my hat back. See? Mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, what has hurt among the Indian, the many different uh, denominations. One will come along and say something about his particular brand. Mm -hmm. Another one will come along and be an altogether different brand. So uh, it confuses the Indian mind. Mm -hmm. And the Indian will say, uh, well, those people, they've got books and all read. They're supposed to be learned. Said, if they can't get together, why do we want to get mixed up in their fight? See? Mm -hmm. I guess it's been a pretty full day, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. <laughs> it's been a good day. Well. Earl Belknap, the editor of Norm Transcript, turned my name in to the Oklahoma Heritage Association. And I, long one year, but I realize it was more of an exclusive club. So when Denzel was elected president of the Oklahoma Historical Society, well, I got thinking, well, that'd be a good place. I have material that I don't want to be destroyed and a place where it'd be secure. And uh, I gave, uh, what, did you read this? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. I gave uh, about 7,000, 8,000 books to the Cook Tr Christian Training School out in Tempe, Arizona. The reason White Parker, uh, one of the sons of Quanah Parker, went to school out there, and he was the pastor when the Lord called me to teach. So I gave it in recognition of White Parker, about seven or eight thousand books. Yeah. And uh, I have given more than 10,000 books away. I've given more than 25 families uh, 
fine encyclopedias and distributed more than a half million articles of clothing. We were the first to get commodities for the Indians in Oklahoma and had to provide for our own transportation. And uh, you will not find another mission like it in the world where an Indian woman paid for all the initial cost. And we have never asked for an offering for herself. 32 years. The most that I've ever received for my pastoral support, $300 a month. That lasts five months. First year I never received a penny support, a church or board of missions. Second year, $50 a month. And uh, the first two years put 100,000 miles on a brand new GMC pickup. So are you talking to Senator Garrison about putting the records in the Historical Society? There? Well, I mentioned to him. Yeah. I told him I had some things that I think that it would be very good to, to be in the Historical Society. I have uh, uh, my time books, yeah. early 30s, 50 cents an hour, 25 cents for labor common labor. I had the governor's mansion twice before Governor Turner moved in and and uh, while Johnson and Murray was governor. I had the Senate lounge, lobby, committee rooms, corridors. Most of the departments in the state capitol had all the outside openings. What was your job at the capitol? What did you do? Painting contract. Painting contract. Mm-hmm and uh, had a well, time for the big payroll. Had a payroll to meet every Friday. Union, I had a journeyman's card when I was 19 years old. I'm a master of my trade. I could go any city in the United States, even at 78 years old, and because I'm recognized as a master of my trade, I couldn't do the production that I used to do, but I could get a job and go to work, union. Mm -hmm. uh, I was known and noted a uh, color man, oil-based. I'd match any plant, any bark, any wood, any metal, anything. Perfect match. I had the uh, Federal Reserve Bank branch in Houston, four-story building, uh, terracotta stone. It had a copper uh, cornice. They removed the stone and had a copper cornice around two sides of it. And I matched the terracotta stone this copper. No one could tell but what it was stone. Down on the wall. The head of the bank in Dallas and the architect in New York, several of them came to inspect. Mr. Gentry, the managing director of the Federal Reserve Bank in Houston, he is out in the front and he called their attention to the stonework up there. And all these people said, that's a wonderful job of laying that stone, that cornice. He said, that's copper. None of them believe it. He had to take them up on the roof and let them beat them. See? Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the kind of jobs that are uh, like to do. I like to do things that other people say can't be done. Mm -hmm. Same way right out here was a lot of people didn't think I'd stay six months. And many of them hoping I wouldn't. 
see. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but I fooled them. Well, Reverend Reynolds, I want to thank you. Um, Enjoyed having you.